So thanks again for, for joining us. I see there's all different nationalities coming into us now that um, we have the time time a little bit later for those in the States. So welcome to Ireland and welcome to Mayo. And um, my, my name's Georgia and I have um, Terry Mosley sitting here. If you'd like to give us a little wave, Terry, I'll introduce you properly in a second. Um, so we, we have uh, four um, events coming up for section two of the Mayo Dark Sky webinar. And this first piece, um, we have a gentleman here, Terry Mosley, who I've just mentioned. Terry has a lifelong passion for astronomy. Um, Terry has um, a, a list of accolades, um, including he's been elected the, a fellow of the British Astronomical Association, the Royal Astronomical Association. He's been elected the president of the Irish Astronomical Association for a record four occasions. And he's also received the Queen British Empire Medal for Outreach in Astronomy. And on a common theme here to um, Fred Watson from our earlier session, he's also um, had an asteroid named after him. So Terry, I'm not sure if you'll take the blame if uh, said asteroid should strike the Earth as uh, Fred said he wouldn't. Um, but um, one of the reasons we, um, we have uh, Terry here is to, to give us a little chat later um, about a very special place that has just been accredited um, as an international dark sky park. Um, and that is uh, Dava or Ohm Dark Sky Park in Northern Ireland. Um, the International Dark Sky Association has accredited, accredited it recently as a gold tier dark sky park. So it joins um, a list of three places in the, on the island of Ireland, uh, Kerry International Dark Sky Reserve, uh, who uh, were the first uh, on the island with their gold tier reserve. And ourselves, Mayo International Dark Sky Park, uh, we joined the Dark Sky family in 2014, 2016, sorry. And uh, just more recently now we have Dava, um, our own Dark Sky Park and Observatory. So this session, what we're going to do is to play a, sh a video for you, uh, first of all, and that's giving you a nice introduction to um, Dava and Ohm and the observatory there. And uh, then we will hand over to Terry uh, to, to give us a, a little chat about it um, and some feedback. And obviously your questions, um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get a, a nice collection of questions to put to Terry afterwards. So at the moment, I'm conscious, Terry, you've been muted. Do you want to just say anything before we go into the video or are you? Happy enough? Later, I don't have any official connection with the Ohm Dark Sky Park. I've been doing it just on a voluntary capacity, but I have been involved from uh, near the beginning. So I'll say a wee bit more about that later, I hope. I just want to stress that because somebody earlier uh, today said that I was from the Ohm uh, Dark Sky Park and not just an uh, entirely voluntary uh, association. Otherwise, there? fine, go ahead. Okay, all right, and we'll chat to you more about it later. Thanks, Terry. So I'm just going to share my screen now. I'll mute you again, Terry. Welcome to Northern Ireland's first dark sky park. My name is Mary McKeown. I am the tourism manager from the Ulster District Council and I had the vision to look at the potential of a dark sky park here in Dava Forest. We are the second dark sky park in the island of Ireland. There's another dark sky park in Mayo that is running this fantastic festival. 
Ten years ago, I completed a learning journey with my colleagues from Cookstown Council to Galloway Forest. And we saw that there was a dark sky park in the forest. When I returned home, I investigated the possibility of a dark sky park here in Dava. Dava in Irish stands for cauldron, and that is a natural bowl. Here in Dava, there is a protected ring that prevents light pollution coming into this area. And how I know that is back 10 years ago, we went and put up sky quality meter readers and measured the darkness of the sky. With the help of Mark Bailey and James Finnegan, who a few of you may know, we started to measure the darkness of the sky here in Dava. And the results were phenomenal. We were as dark as Galloway, Mayo and down in Kerry. Today, I would like to introduce you to my good friend, Terry Mosley from the Irish Astronomical Association. Terry will tell you the links with the dark sky and why the people so many years ago laid the stones where we are standing today. The Beckmoor site where we are here is an amazing complex of stone circles, stone rows, alignments and cairns and it's all part of the Ohm Dark Sky Park complex. This complex of stone circles and stone rows and alignments and cairns is a fascinating place. It has intrigued archaeologists and astronomers ever since it was first discovered. What happened was that these uh, features here were built four to 5,000 years ago by people that lived here in this amazing site. The climate then changed and uh, it became no longer habitable. The, uh, all the stone megaliths and the rows and the circles were covered over by turf and they were eventually discovered much more recently by a local farmer who was literally cutting away the turf. And the site then was exposed and developed and studied by the archaeologists. And what we have is a complex of seven circles and a whole lot of rows uh, of stones pointing in various directions, but mainly, as far as we can see, pointing very close to where the midsummer uh, sun rises, the midsummer solstice. Not exactly, but pretty close. We don't know the reason for the rows or the alignments. We don't know the purpose of the circles. It could have been ceremonial. It could have been for social gatherings. It could have been uh, some sort of a, a funeral, a burial chamber, something like that. But as far as the astronomers are concerned, there are lots of examples where these megalithic sites have an astronomical connection. Um, Stonehenge in England is probably the best known. There are others in Ireland. And so there's a lot of interest in whether the alignments of the stone rows were astronomical. And as I said, they're very close to where the midsummer sun rises, but not exactly. So close, but no cigar, as they say. There's possibility that there were other connections that we don't know about. For example, back then there could have been things in the sky such as a very bright comet or a supernova explosion or something like that. Some amazing event that was in the sky and they marked it by building these rows pointing in that direction. We'll simply never know. The rows also are not all exactly parallel. There are some that diverge very slightly. They could possibly be sort of a ceremonial passageway. We simply don't know about that. But the amazing thing when we think about it now and we come here away from the light pollution of our modern society is that we can see the sky almost exactly as they saw it when these uh, amazing um, monuments or whatever they are were built. We can see the Milky Way, which is something that you will hardly see at all in any built up area or anywhere where there's uh, bright lights around your own house even. And the Milky Way is the most amazing thing because we're looking at the whole of our galaxy, 100,000 million stars of which our sun is only one. So you can come here and see the Milky Way and if you've never seen it before, you're looking at the plane of our galaxy. It's a flattened disk. And when you look along the plane of that disk, then you're seeing a lot more stars than when you look in any other direction. And that's how we get the effect of the Milky Way. You can also come and see the stars themselves, the different brightnesses, the different colors. You can see the motion of the planets as they move along the stars. You can watch the phases of the moon as it changes. The moon have been uh, probably the second most important object in the sky to the ancient people. The sun obviously was the most important because it controlled the seasons, controlled agriculture, it controlled their, their life on a, a yearly basis. But the moon gave them a much shorter calendrical measure of 29 and a half days or so. 
So they would have observed the changing phases of the moon. They'd have been much more familiar with how it moved and how its appearance changed than most people are nowadays. You can come along and see that for yourself. They have a, a fantastic observatory where you can actually see detail on the moon and the planets. They would have also noticed the motion of the planets against the background stars. Planet means literally a wandering star or a moving star. We now know that they're all orbiting around the sun. The Earth is just one of them. We don't think that they had that amount of knowledge, but we simply don't know. So this site is from a place where you can come back now and try and travel back in time in your imagination to four or five thousand years ago. Put away everything that we know now about the universe. Look up at the sky and try and put yourself in the position of the people that built these uh, monuments and circles and rows and alignments and think, what were they thinking of? What was the purpose for these? And just enjoy the night sky the way they would have seen it all that long ago. So whatever the reason why this amazing complex of rows and circles and alignments was built, we don't know. You're welcome to make up your own mind. You can imagine what it was like here four or five thousand years ago when this place was built. Absolutely no light pollution and the local people were looking at the sky and wondering what was going on with the motion of the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets and how that related to their concept of where they were in the universe and we can then go back to the modern state-of-the-art observatory at home in Dava and look at what we know now about the universe. Java lies in a naturally suppressed landscape in natural bog and peat and this provides the, the perfect location for observing the stars. This is an image of Ireland taken from the International Space Station and it shows the levels of light pollution across Ireland and as you can see Dava is located in the centre between Belfast City and Derry City stroke Londonderry. Approximately 80% of the world's population cannot see the stars and that's because the sky is polluted by what we call sky glow. If you look at the image here of Cookstown you can, taken at night you can see where the sky has been polluted and there's no view of the stars. Compared to this image taken outside the observatory on a dark, clear night, which shows a beautiful inky dark sky where you can see the Milky Way with the naked eye. Gaining the IDA accreditation helps protect the only dark sky park in Northern Ireland for future generations to enjoy. Um, Dark Sky Park and Observatory here at Dava Forest. If you'd like to follow me through to the observatory where you'll meet Adam, one of our amateur astronomers. Hi everyone, my name is Adam Jeffers and I'm one of the amateur astronomers up at Alm. My interest in astrophotography started in 2007 where I began using a mobile phone to take pictures through a small telescope. I then progressed on to using a digital SLR camera and now I'm using dedicated astro cameras with a computerised telescope in mind. Astrophotography covers photography of a broad variety of subjects. These include the moon and planets, nightscapes with interesting foreground landmarks, the Milky Way and deep sky nebula taken through a telescope. My particular interest lies with the deep sky imaging. Deep sky objects such as galaxies and nebula are faint and require a telescope and a lot of time or exposure to capture their details. So how does the telescope help? Well, if you imagine the telescope as a bucket collecting raindrops, the bigger the bucket, the more raindrops will be collected over a period of time. This diameter is referred to as aperture. Bigger telescopes help to capture fainter light. Now, if you make a hole in the bottom of the bucket, the collected water flows out as a steady stream. I think the telescope is collecting droplets of faint light and effectively concentrating them into a brighter beam of light 
to be seen by the eye or the camera at the other end. So what do I mean by exposure? When you take any image with a camera, be it an iPhone or a DSLR, a shutter opens up to allow light to hit the sensor. The sensor is the device that records the image. If open too long, the image is too bright. If not open long enough, the image is too dark. But most cameras automatically calculate this for you. Deep sky objects are very faint, so we need to manually control the shutter. We open the shutter and leave it open to allow faint light to fall upon the sensor for long periods of time. Typically with your phone, the exposure time may be 0.01 of a second and you get your subjects to stand still while you're taking it to avoid blurring. When we do deep sky imaging, the exposure time can often be in the region of 300, 600 or even 900 seconds. This presents a significant problem because we are standing on the Earth which is spinning relative to the stars, nebula and galaxies that we are trying to photograph. The next image shows what happens if we simply place a camera on a normal tripod and expose the sky without any tracking. In order to compensate for the Earth's movement, we use a mount for the telescope that has motor drive. Once the mount is lined up with the rotational axis of the Earth, the movement can be compensated for using the motor and the stars appear as pinpoints of light rather than streaks. Further improvements are made to this tracking using a process called auto-guiding. If we look at the 14-inch MEET telescope in the observatory, we can see there's a smaller telescope mounted on top of the main telescope. The smaller telescope and camera locks onto a star and sends continuous signals to the main telescope to keep it tracking accurately throughout the long exposure. The MEET 14-inch telescope is a go-to telescope, which means it can accurately go to any target that the user wishes. At the simple touch of a button, this telescope will slew to and track any deep sky object. This is particularly useful if the object is very faint and cannot be seen visually. So how accurate is the tracking of this telescope? Well, it's actually very accurate. This telescope can track at less than one arc second. So what does that mean in real terms? Well, if we were to leave here and walk a distance of two miles and hold up our index finger, this telescope can track the width of your finger at a distance of two miles over the whole night. Another challenge we face with deep sky imaging is light pollution. This is not a problem up here at all, but from an urban location, stray light has a significant impact. Because deep sky objects are fainter than the overwhelming background of light pollution, they are swamped with light and are effectively invisible to both the naked eye and camera. A long exposure photograph from a light polluted area will not reveal the same degree of detail as one taken from a place like home. The Moon is an exception to light pollution and can be viewed from any location. The Moon is in a synchronous orbit with Earth, so that we always see the same half. However, the Moon wobbles a little bit as it does so, and we actually end up seeing 59% of the surface. This effect, known as libration, periodically reveals hidden craters at the very edge of the Moon. One such crater is the Maunder Crater, named after Annie Maunder, an astronomer from Strabane, who around the turn of the 20th century did extensive work on the Sun and solar eclipses. We can now take a look at some images that I've taken using long exposures and a tracking mount. This is a two-panel mosaic image of Andromeda Galaxy. We are looking at a spiral galaxy similar to our own Milky Way, and it is 2.5 million light years away. It is the furthest object that you can see with the naked eye and is visible from home due to the dark skies. It contains around a thousand billion stars or suns, more than double the stars in our own galaxy. If you consider that each of these stars may have a planet orbiting it, there is the potential for billions and billions of planets, with perhaps some similar to our own Earth. The Tadpole Nebula is a dim glowing patch of dust and gas located 12,000 light years from Earth. The tadpole-like structures are dense cooler gas and dust that are being shaped by the intense radiation from a young bright hot cluster of stars embedded within the nebulosity. The tadpoles measure 10 light years in length, which is about 58 million million miles. The Horsehead Nebula in Orion is an iconic object from the winter skies. It is a small dark nebula located just to the south of Alnitak, the easternmost star of Orion's belt. The Horsehead Nebula is approximately 1,375 light years from Earth and is extremely difficult to see visually. Long exposure imaging easily picks up the faint signal. The deep red colour originates from an ionised hydrogen gas that is present throughout space. The Ring Nebula is a planetary nebula about 2,000 light years from Earth. A once sun-like star has reached the end of its life and has puffed off its outer layers of gas. The star collapses and gives off intense UV radiation. This radiation ionises the surrounding gas and produces the beautiful reds, greens and blues. This image is taken through the Mead telescope with an astro video camera. It produces almost live images straight onto a screen and reveals more colour and structure than you would see with just visually looking. Astrophotography can be expensive, but affordable avenues for beginners are there to start the journey. The starting point would be a compact wide field refractor, a tracking equatorial mount and a DSLR camera. If you want to learn more about the sky, telescopes or anything astronomical, come up and visit us and chat to the team at home.
Great, that was beautiful. Um, I'm going to just switch on your sound. I think it's on actually, Terry. Hi, can you hear yeah, me just, okay? Yep, yeah, testing, that's great. Now we've had some, a lot of comments. I couldn't see all of them coming in, but um, let me just go to the questions first of all. Um, okay, we have a question from Ema McCarthy. And Ema's asking, has anyone carried out x-rays of that wonderful ground Mr. Mosley is speaking from, please? I'd love to know what's underneath. Thank you for this talk, it's excellent. So that's some nice feedback from Ema. Right, uh, they haven't used x-rays because that <laughs> wouldn't really be appropriate, but they have used what they call ground penetrating radar. First of all, uh, apologies, there was a time delay between the visual and the, the sound on that uh, video. And I see it's actually the same again now live. So I hope that isn't too distracting. Yes, uh, the site has been surveyed. Uh, basically, it was only a very small part of the site um, was excavated because it literally was a farmer's land and he started cutting turf. Uh, the uh, land was then taken over by the um, archaeological service of, of the government and now I think it's operated by uh, mid Ulster District Council. But yes, the surrounding area has been um, surveyed by ground penetrating radar. There are other stones at the moment. We don't have permission to excavate the rest of them. So uh, maybe that will happen sometime in the future. But at the moment, we simply know that there's other stuff there, but we can't get a complete picture. But as I say, that may happen sometime in the future, but a very good question. Okay, thanks, Terry. Um, we have another question, um, one, one that I'd say a lot of people ask, and that's what, is, what does OM mean? Ah, mm -hmm. that's a good, good question. <laughs> it's supposed to represent the sound of the universe, OM, or whatever mm -hmm. way you want to do it. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it almost uh, tunes in with a sort of a Buddhist philosophy or something like that. But um, they hired a firm of consultants to come up with uh, a sort of a tag or a name or a brand name. And that's what they came up with. So that's, you have to imagine. That's a good name. Uh, the universe is silent. You can imagine, you can hear the sound of the universe. Um, <laughs> that's the answer. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, okay, Terry, now we have a lot of comments also coming in here, so I'll just read one or two of them to you. So we have uh, Friedel Pass in, in Belgium. Who Hi, I Friedel. <laughs> uh, so Friedel says, uh, but astronomy is not the only thing related to light pollution. Their loss, uh, the loss there is just a symptom of light pollution. The moon can cause the same symptom. So I guess well, he's, he's, uh, the, the loss of the stars, I think he means, uh, through, through full moonlight, which we have tonight. So, Yep. Yeah. Uh, hi, Friedel. Good to hear from you. Yes, as, as uh, many of your uh, dark sky festivals have um, emphasized over the past, I'm glad to be participating in this one, even though it's uh, not actually being there. Uh, it was the first one I haven't actually been there. Yes, the, the effect of light pollution affects the whole environment, uh, not just astronomy. And uh, I didn't go into that because I, I'm sure it's covered uh, elsewhere in great detail. But um, while the astronomers were the first ones to notice it, uh, every environmentalist and biologist is now aware of the effects of light pollution on all forms of wildlife, and it's a serious issue. It is, really. Okay, um, just scrolling through some, um, some lovely comments, um, Terry. We'll have to gather them all up and send uh, to you. We have one from um, the Shepherd's Rest campsite, uh, who I, I oh, yeah. believe you probably know. Just say hi, Colin from... Uh, he's saying thank you for the day so far and your team hope to see some of you soon we certainly hope so too Colin that we can get up and, and visit and do you want to tell us something about the um the planned launch because I know it was postponed yeah. Terry um which is a pity obviously but uh, so much has been postponed this year so um if you have any news for us on that that would be great to hear about yeah, it was due in March, uh, but because we were sort of heading into the worst of the, the pandemic at the time locally, that was postponed. They were going to try again then in October, whenever we thought that the worst of it was over. And now, as you know, we're sort of heading into a, a reasonably bad second wave. So it has been postponed and will, as soon as things are, are back to some sort of normality, it will be back to uh, um, 
some sort of uh, official opening. At the moment, you can go into the site, uh, but you can't go into the building. It's not officially open. It's uh, Dava um, Dark Sky Park, but it's in Dava Forest. It's very popular with mountain bikers and, and people just like hikers and walkers and so on. So you can go there and you can see the outside of the building. You can also go to Beckmore Stone Circles, which are open all the time. Um, and uh, go and, as I said in that video clip, try and make up your own mind about what, what they mean. They're fairly well signposted in the area, but uh, the short answer is I don't know when the actual facility itself will open the, the, the building. Okay, okay. Well, we'll keep an eye out on that, and um, we'll put we'll pop up the website so people can follow um, that and, and hopefully visit. Uh, very soon. Um, I'll just list off a couple of uh, people from, from all over the world. I see Nepal has joined us now, so you're very welcome. Um, and the USA, and we have Belgium with Friedel and Germany. So we're, we're very international here, which is great. I'm just scanning to see if I can see any other questions. Well, Terry, we, we had a question earlier in one of the sessions with um, Fred and Marnie about um, the blue moon. <laughs> And what the blue moon was, so we thought maybe we'd save that for for you to to uh, settle the dispute. Let's say. <laughs> okay, have you got three hours? <laughs> there you have it. Uh, this is one of my pet subjects or pet rants. The original meaning of blue moon was literally when the moon, on very very rare occasions, appeared to turn blue. The first time it was noticed or remarked on was after the explosion of the great uh, volcano in Indonesia, Krakatoa, and I think it was 1882, and that cast so much aerosol and fine particles of dust and soot up into the upper atmosphere that they scattered the light, red light, and basically the moon appeared blue. That was a very, very rare occasion. It's only happened once or twice since with other volcanic eruptions. And that gave rise to the expression, once in a blue moon, meaning literally a very, very rare, unexpected event. What happened was that in 1937, the editor of the Maine Farmer's Journal, Maine State in the USA, totally out of the blue, came up with his own interpretation of what a blue moon meant. Maybe he didn't, he had hadn't heard of the, the original effect in Krakatoa, but he came up with the suggestion that if there were ever four moons, four full moons in one season, i.e. spring, summer, autumn or winter, that the third one of the four would be a blue moon. How he came up with that, nobody knows. Then Scan Telescope magazine, about a decade later, they had a columnist writing that came across this article, but he completely misinterpreted it. And he thought, that what the guy was trying to say was, if you had two full moons in the same month, the second full moon would be a blue moon. Now, Sky and Telescope, to their credit, later published a correction. But as in the case of many corrections, nobody noticed the correction. And then the, the uh, presenter of a radio program in the United States, again, about, I think it was about 1980, Deborah Bird on a, a program called Earth Sky, came across the original article in Sky and Telescope, wasn't aware of the correction, and she started promoting the idea that the second full moon in a month would be a blue moon. Then the astrologers got it and it sort of spread worldwide. But it's an absolutely normal standard occurrence. It'll, it'll happen eight times between now and 2037. Sometimes you even get three of them within four months, as happened in 2010. And a moon does not turn blue. It's just a perfectly ordinary moon. If you uh, think about it, it's bound to happen every so often. There's 29 and a half days between full moon, one full moon and the next. And yet all our months except February have either 30 days or 31 days. So sooner or later, you're bound to get two full moons in the same month. They're not blue, they're not any other color. You might as well call it a salty moon or a, a cute moon or whatever name you want to think of it if you think it's special. But actually, it's no more special than having, for example, five Sundays in the same month or four, five Saturdays in the same month. It just happens uh, automatically because of the, the number of days in, in a week and the number of days in a month. Same thing with the moon. So that's the rant over. <laughs> that's very well explained, Terry. Thank you. Okay. That's, uh, that's settled the, the debate, let's say. Um, okay, we have a couple of other, just on the moon uh, theme again. Uh, Colin Doyle, what causes new moons to sit at different angles in the sky? Older people, this is interesting, yeah. Older people always talked about the moon while predicting future months' weather. We found that here in Mayo on some, some work we had done. So uh, Colin says, on, here, 
back a dry month, is there a written record of these predictions? Um, so, Sorry, I'm not sure what the question is. You want so to be there, he's, Georgia? He's, he's talking about um, I, um, traditions and um, uh, he, he says older people always talked about the moon while predicting future months weather. So the moon's sitting at a different angle. So when the moon's on its back, um, it would be a dry month. So I think that's just superstition. Right, I haven't come across that. <laughs> um, that's just, again, a, a phenomenon depending on the position of the moon in the sky and where you are on planet Earth. We're here in a relatively high northern latitude, about 54 or so degrees, and we see the moon totally different to somebody on the equator. And if somebody's down the southern hemisphere, for example, the Australians, they'll see the moon sort of reversed in the sky. If you happen to see the video of the uh, sunset taken from Australia, the sun was setting in the opposite direction to what it appears here because you're simply looking at it from the other side of the earth. So I haven't come across that particular thing, but I cannot imagine how that would have any effect whatsoever on the weather. It, it will depend on um, the time of year here because the moon um, obviously follows the same path around the sky as the sun approximately. Uh, and in the summer, they, when the moon is new, it's quite close to the sun, so it's uh, high up in the northern part of the sky. Uh, and whenever it's full moon, it's opposite the sun in the sky. So in the summer, the full moon is always low down near the horizon. And in winter, when the sun is low down, the full moon is high up in the sky. But apart from the angle of the moon, how it would affect the weather, I, I cannot imagine. No, no, I think it's a, it's a heritage tradition that uh, Colin yeah. is probably re referring to. We have similar, similar to Red, Red Sky at Night, Shepherd's Delight, that, that kind of thing. Um, so we have another question here from John Bradley. Uh, can you make contributions to research using the modest kinds of telescopes available at your site? Yes, very much so. Um, there are all sorts of things that happen, like, for example, some stars vary on a regular basis for all sorts of reasons. There are so many of them that the professional astronomers can't keep uh, track of them all because the big telescopes are, are busy looking out into deep space and there's so much demand for time on them that they're quite often doing other uh, fairly fundamental astronomical astrophysical research. But um, studying of variable stars is one of the things that uh, you can do with even a pair of binoculars or a modest telescope. But as Adam was showing with those amazing photographs, some of them were taken with, with bigger telescopes, a lot of them were taken either with just uh, the, the camera or with a, a relatively modest telescope. You can do things like, for example, searching for supernovae, which go off at random in other galaxies. And with the sensitivity of modern CCD cameras, you can uh, detect things that are millions to, upon millions of times fainter than the uh, naked eye. Now, there are hundreds of thousands of millions of other galaxies in the universe. We can't see all of them, but within the reach of uh, a, a modest amateur telescope, you can see many, many millions of them. And uh, we never know in advance when a supernova is going to go off. Uh, if you image uh, a galaxy on a regular basis, suddenly a bright star appears in the galaxy that wasn't there before you've mm -hmm. detected a supernova. There are all sorts of different uh, sorts of supernovae, so it's very important to um, detect them as soon as possible and start taking spectra of them to show what, what elements are involved and how the light curve varies. And what's absolutely fascinating is that you and I wouldn't be here if there weren't for supernovae because the, all the elements in the universe heavier than lithium were created in supernovae or other cataclysmic events. So the iron in your blood and the gold in the ring in your finger didn't come just out of nothing. They were created in supernovae explosions and other fundamentally uh, explosive events. So uh, supernovae are essential to the existence of life in the universe. So we need to know as much about them as possible. So the answer is yes, very much so. I've only uh, touched on two aspects there, but there are other things you can do as well. Brilliant. Um, just changing tact here, going slightly back to the archaeology uh, theme, uh, Jed Darling has posed a question. Has Frank Prendergast, uh, the eminent archaeoastronomer, visited uh, the site at Ohm and surveyed it? Yes, I know Frank well. He's a, a, fun, a brilliant researcher in this area. I don't know for a fact that he's been to Beckmore, but I'd be very, very surprised if he hasn't. He's done quite a bit of research, for example, down at Loch Gur in Limerick, uh, and uh, he, he's an expert on this subject, so I'd be very, very surprised if he hasn't been there.
Uh, but lots of people have done it, uh, local archaeologists. Now, a lot of archaeologists are interested in the archaeology. You know, are there burials there? Are there remains of, of human bones? Are there uh, ancient pottery shards or things like that? Uh, Frank Bridges, that, um, that sort of a gap, if you like, between the archaeologists and the astronomers. And he would be looking at it very closely from the point of view of uh, astroarchaeology. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'd be very, very surprised if it hasn't actually hasn't. been there. We might find that out by the end of today, actually, because I, I know Frank had signed up for some of the sessions, so I think he's right. joining us later on, so we can ask him. That's, that's great. Um, Paul Campbell now. We have, uh, again, going back to the moon. Um, he says, I understand the exact time of the full moon actually yeah. happens during this 2 to 3 p.m. talk today, Halloween, the 31st of October, which is the eve of All Hallows, the eve of All Saints Day, at 2 yeah. p.m. Irish time, very specific. Does Terry yeah. agree? Yes, absolutely, yes. Yeah. We're now past summer time, so we're back in what we call universal time or Greenwich Mean time, and that's correct, yes, spot on. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that, Paul. Um, we have uh, Jim Carolyn next. Uh, Jim says, how do the angles of the walls and the relative positions of the stone circles compare to other sites on the island? Right, good question. Everybody I think in Ireland knows of Newgrange and if you haven't been there as soon as it's open again, if you haven't been, you should go there. It is one of the sites where it's absolutely unquestioned that there's a very definite alignment with the mid-winter solstice sunrise. There's no question about that whatsoever. Uh, it, it's world famous for that uh, fact and the, the way the light shines into the inner chamber and illuminates it uh, just a day or two on either side of the, the winter solstice as well. There's another one down in Cork called Drumbeg Stone Circle and it has a, a almost certain astronomical alignment with the mid-winter solstice sunset. The alignment of the circle is such that there's a sort of uh, two large stones forming an entrance. On the opposite side of that entrance is a flat stone called the heel stone and if you stand uh, at the entrance stone and look across the heel stone on the midwinter solstice, the sun sets in a very definite marked notch on the horizon. So it's a three-way alignment, and it's almost certainly deliberate, not, not uh, accidental. There are various other ones in Ireland where there are possible alignments, but we don't know for certain. But those are two others where, where it's at. In one case, absolutely certain, and the other case, 99% certain. Um, the trouble with some of the stone circles in Ireland is that the stones have been moved, um, either by natural forces or by our, uh, farmers getting a stone out of the way so they can uh, plow the whole of a field. Uh, there's a very inter interesting circle in County Down, which I think has an alignment with the sunset and a notch between two of the mountains in uh, the mountains of Morne. But... Uh, because some of the stones, the outlier stones, if you like, have been moved, it's not absolutely certain. There's another one, um, a very famous one in, in Donegal, uh, where again, there's uh, a lot of people think there's an alignment with uh, the midwinter, or sorry, the midsummer sun, uh, sunrise, but again, not absolutely certain. The alignment isn't exact, but uh, it's a field that's been attracting more and more interest. Um, because it, it tells us something about the degree of knowledge and the degree of interest of the ancient civilizations of which there's no written record whatsoever. We're talking about uh, approximately 5,000 years ago for Newgrange. And as I said in the video, between four and 5,000 years ago for the, the stone circles at Beckmore, most of these ones are approximately of that age. They're more recent archeological monuments like portal tombs and so on, which are more recent. Uh, but even they don't have any record, uh, written record of what they're about. Um, the civilization that built those, I mean, they're way, way pre-Celtic. Yeah. Um, we like sort of the, the Celtic symbol of the interlocking sp uh, spiral, the tri-spiral that they get on the rocks of Newgrange. But the, the civilization that uh, built Newgrange was thousands of years before the Celts arrived in Ireland. Um, so huge amount that we still don't know. Absolutely. It's, it's like a jigsaw to build it up, as you, as you say. Um, OK, I'm just going to we'll probably take two more quick questions. And uh, I just wanted to draw um, folks attention to the poll that we have up at the moment, because it's in some interesting results on that. We, we asked um, about star counts and mm -hmm. uh, on a clear night, how many stars can you see at any one time with the naked eye in a dark sky place? 
So that I'm going to leave that just for a second to let more people um, uh, enter that poll, and then we'll we'll check out the results and see if they match up with our expectations, Terry. And um, I'm just going to go to Chile now, and I think this is too big a question to answer, uh, but let's let's throw it out there anyway. Paulina uh, Villo, Villalobos, uh, hello from Chile, and she says, "How different is the night sky in the northern hemisphere compared to the southern hemisphere?" What can I see there that I can't see here? I think we might be here for a long time to answer that one, but uh, maybe just give us one example. Terry, yeah. um, the, uh, as you maybe saw from some of the stuff in the earlier presentation, uh, the southern sky is actually more spectacular than the northern sky. There are good points about each. Uh, but the reason for that is that the centre of our galaxy, the centre of the Milky Way galaxy, lies south of the celestial equator. We can see it from here in Northern Ireland, or the whole island of Ireland uh, and Europe, but it's always fairly low down on the horizon. If you're in the southern hemisphere, it can pass right overhead. So you're looking at the very brightest, most spectacular part of the Milky Way, which is uh, our own galaxy. We also have things there like the Magellanic Clouds, two satellites of our uh, galaxy. Again, they showed up in some of the photographs. We can't see them from here. They have the best globular cluster in the sky in the Southern Hemisphere. On the other hand, they don't have a proper pole star the way we have Polaris. The nearest uh, star to the southern pole in the sky is a very, very faint star called Sigma of Tantus, which you can barely see with the naked eye. So we have that advantage. We also have uh, what we call the flower, or the Americans call the Big Dipper, which point all the, points all the time to the North Star. Uh, we have other things that they don't see so well, like the Pleiades, the best uh, star cluster in the sky. So there are pros and cons, but basically at any one time from the, uh, any point on the surface of the Earth, you can only see half of the sky. And in terms of latitude, for example, if you were at the North Pole, you could only see the whole of the northern half of the sky through the course of the year. And if you're down at the South Pole in Antarctica, you would see, uh, never see anything north of the, the celestial equator, you wouldn't see, for example, the fly or the pole star. And in between then, the amount that you can see depends just how close you are to the equator. On the equator, you can see everything in the sky sooner or later if you get through the whole year. So the, the, we have some good things, but on the whole, the general consensus is that the southern hemisphere is a better view of the night sky than we do here. Okay, gives us good enough reason to, to get there one of these days. Yeah, fantastic. Um, okay, uh, one more question and then I'll, I'll look at the poll. So we have uh, Colette Dark and Colette says, uh, does the, well, I'm sure this is a, a yes, but does the observatory run public viewing events and lectures? Um, yes, it will it, do. Yeah, it will do. Um, also, it will be uh, access, provide access for the disabled. Uh, and for most things, you won't actually look through the eyepiece because only one person can do that at a time. The telescope will be coupled up, coupled up to a monitor. So uh, a dozen or so people, which is round about the maximum you can fit in the observatory at any one time, they'll all be able to see what's on the screen. It's not quite the same as seeing it with your own eye, but uh, with, the, with the latest um, CCD and other IT technology, we can produce a fantastic uh, view on that monitor. And you can also then point out things that you can't point out when somebody is actually looking through the eyepiece themselves. There'll also be other portable telescopes there that people can borrow. You can bring along your own. Uh, so yes, uh, you'll be able to uh, see things. And we also hope that at times when it's not being used by the public, it will actually be used for proper astronomical research. Fantastic. Okay, it's a great facility. And now onto our poll. So I'm going to share the results here and see what you think, Terry. So uh, right. we have uh, uh, <laughs> we have 11 percent of people uh, think that on a clear sky, uh, clear night uh, you can see 1,000 uh, st stars with the naked eye in a dark sky place. 21% 2,500 and 68% say 5,000. So. What are your thoughts on that, Ter Terry? We were saying it's debatable. Yeah, uh, the, the figure is closer to the middle figure, uh, which is surprising because I have gone out on a clear night and after my eyes have adapted, the sky seems literally full of stars. 
uh, so much so that sometimes you can't identify the, the, the main constellations because there are so many stars visible. But the actual figure is between 2,500 and 3,000, depending on how good your eyesight is. Now, that may be surprising, but I mean, that is a, an actual fact. If you have exceptionally good eyesight, then you can see a lot more uh, because the, the number of stars that are visible go up uh, as the number of stars gets fainter. It's a bit like a, uh, if you have a beach which has uh, rocks and, and stones and, and boulders and pebbles and sand on it, there are only one or two maybe large rocks. There are a bigger number of, of uh, uh, large stones, much greater number of even smaller stones, absolutely huge number of pebbles, and then an infinite number of sand grains. So if your eyesight is good enough to see something that's just slightly fainter, than somebody else, then you're going to see an awful lot more stars. I'm afraid my eyesight isn't as good as it used to be, so I'm probably near the, the two and a half thousand and the three thousand. But um, there, there is absolutely nothing to beat seeing a sky full of stars. I remember taking a friend of mine who lived in, in the city in Belfast out to a dark sky site up in the Antrim Hills, a uh, place I used to go to observe meteors, and he had never really been much out of the city in his life. And as we drove up the, the hill, as a long straight road, I turned the headlights down to side lights because I, I knew the, the road well and we could be sure nothing else was coming. So our eyes, our eyes dark adapted and he got out of the sky, out of car and he just could not believe what he was saying. He was dumbstruck. And as you say, it's so difficult then to identify even common constellations that you'd yeah. be familiar with when this, the sky is yeah. just full of, of stars. And of course, you can see lots more things like meteors, which mm -hmm. you probably won't see. There are meteors there in the sky all the time, all year round. We get showers every so often. That's another thing, by the way, that we're better in the northern hemisphere than the southern. We have much better mm -hmm. meteor showers than they do. But... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, we'll ignore that for the moment. But you see meteors, you see unfortunately lots of things like the Starlink satellites that we were talking about earlier. Uh, you'll see a Rory, uh, much, much better. In fact, you normally don't see a Rory at all uh, in the city or the suburbs. You need to get out of a really dark sky. And uh, you'll see quite a lot of the dark sky objects or deep sky objects with your own eyes. You can see the Rand Nebula, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy, as uh, Adam mentioned, was just a thing you can see with the naked eye. A whole lot of other star clusters and so on. It's absolutely amazing. Well, the message is, I think, to get out there and look. And, you know, if you are trying to count uh, however many thousand stars, um, what we can do then is uh, suggest that people look at a thing called the Globe at Night Project. Yeah. Again, yeah. we'll put that link in for, for people to, to check out. And that's somewhere where we can ha get uh, citizen science going with people counting stars in certain constellations and reporting in those facts. And by doing that, you are helping us to assess the light pollution in your, your night sky. So I think on, on that note, Terry, I know there are other questions um, which we won't can get I to right now. A, a little plug for two things coming up that mm -hmm. are absolutely uh, not to be missed. One is in the middle of December, there's the best meteor shower of the year, the Geminids. And if you sort of Google it, you'll find all about it. That's around about the 14th, 15th of December. And uh, there's no uh, full moon at the time. The moon is new at the time. So ideal conditions for observing it. Another thing not to be missed, especially if you have a pair of binoculars, on the 21st of December, Jupiter and Saturn will be so close together that you can almost hardly distinguish them. And the view through a telescope will be amazing. You'll be able to see Jupiter and its four moons and probably at least three or four moons of uh, Saturn, all simultaneously in a telescope eyepiece. That won't happen again in anybody's lifetime. Now, admittedly, they're going to be relatively low down in the southwest after sunset, so you'll need a good view to the southwest, but it will be worth it. And again, you could Google that and find out uh, a bit more information. So those are the two highlights coming up of the, the, the night sky within the next couple of months. So cheers to everybody and keep looking up. Thank you. There's great tip, tips to end on, Terry. And what we'll do is we'll post on the Mayo Dark Skies page near the time we'll, we'll post reminders of that so people can find them for themselves. So just to remain to say thank you very much for joining us. Thank you to, to the team at DAVA as well for putting, uh, for OM rather, I keep calling it DAVA, OM uh, Dark Sky Park for uh, putting together that wonderful piece and introducing us to uh, their fantastic Dark Sky Park. So I'll uh, say uh, goodbye to you for now, Terry, and thank you again. And, okay, um, it was a pleasure. Thanks for inviting me.